So welcome back to our normal broadcast this morning, a very special Mother's Day broadcast in the house as our young children from the Children's Church is taking care of our service this morning. And here I am to bring you the word of the Lord flowing with our theme of the power of the spirit life. But again, to all of our mothers, we want to wish you a happy, a prosperous and a blessed Mother's Day. We know the hard work, the efforts, the faithfulness that you put into raising your children and taking care of your families is not unnoticed. And we are blessed that you make Siloam your home. To the mother of the house, our first lady, a visionary and founder of Siloam Word of Truth, Mom Nila, we thank you. We are blessed by your ministry blessed by your life and we are thankful that you mother us in the spirit and in the way that you do your wisdom does not go unnoticed in the next few days it will be mom's birthday it will be the 50th wedding celebration of our bishop and our dear mother we are thankful that we can celebrate with you and we bless you for doing the work of ministry in our lives and that which god has purposed for you to my very own wife to janine Thank you for being such an awesome mother to our children. And again, happy birthday, babe, for your birthday the final few days ago. And we celebrate you in great love and appreciation for being the mother that you are to my children and to just leading them to higher heights. To my moms, my mother-in-law, my mom, happy, happy Mother's Day. I want to pray for our mothers. So if you can stretch out your hands where you are watching this broadcast, I want to pray for you. Father, we are thankful today that we can pray for our dear mothers. We pray a blessing upon them. We pray the blessing of heaven to overwhelm them on this beautiful day as they are celebrated. The efforts, oh God, the purposes of their lives, the faithfulness and the commitment to their children, to their husbands, to children that may not even be their own. We celebrate them today. We place your blessing upon them. We ask of you to be close to them. We ask of you to honor them as we honor them today. As we raise them high, we declare that they are yours. They are covered under your mighty hand. Strengthen them from day to day. Unction them with a greater anointing from day to day. May the grace on their lives work, O oh God. And may they know that they are blessed of the Lord our God. Thank you for our mothers. We speak the blessing of heaven upon them. In Jesus' most holy name, amen and amen. We continue into the word of the Lord this morning. If you have your Bibles, open it with me at Galatians chapter 5 from verse 16 to verse 25 from the New Living Translation. And we continue on, as I said, with our theme, the power of of the spirit-filled life. That's our theme for the month of May. That's what we are asking the Lord to help us with, to live in this power that is only possible by being spirit-filled. If we read the word of the Lord, as Apostle Paul writes it to the church at Galatia, he says, so I, I he says, so as we read the word of the Lord, out of the book of Galatians chapter 5, 16 to 25, Paul writes to the church at Galatia and he says, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature wants. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, 
as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and the desires of the sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. May the Lord bless the exposition of his word this morning. Carrying on and linking back to last week's sermon, we spoke about the distractions and we spoke about the de devices that the enemy uses against us from day to day. Seven things were raised up. And at the end of that sermon, we came up with a remedy for how we battle the discouragement and the despondency and the distress, distress and the despair of what the enemy brings against us. The remedy we said against the devices of the enemy is living a spirit-filled life. Now this morning I want to define what it means to live a spirit-filled life. I want to define for you and I and put into our focus in our minds and in our understanding what spirit-filled life living means. Living the life in the Holy Spirit means that you and I cooperate with the Holy Spirit. We cooperate with the power, the presence, the purpose, and the provision of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It means we are dependent on Him and we yield ourselves to Him. We are dependent on how the Holy Spirit works in and through us. And allow me to, again, be theologically correct and biblically correct to say to us that the Holy Spirit is not a force. It's not an it. The Holy Spirit is the full representation of who God is. The Holy Spirit is a member of the triune being of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So when we speak of the Holy Spirit, we speak of Him. We speak of a person, not just a personality. We speak of him as the person of God in our very lives. So when we define the spiritual living and we define what it means for you and I to walk in this power, we recognize that the Holy Spirit calls on us to be dependent on him daily, to be dependent on him for our living, our day-to-day -day walk in him, and for us to yield ourselves to his prompting, for us to yield ourselves, to surrender ourselves, to give ourselves over, to be obedient to him in all that he purposes and plans in our lives. Now, the Bible teaches us that there are three kinds of man. Namely, number one, the natural man. Now, according to 1 Corinthians 2 and 14, the natural man has not received Christ. The natural man is what you see at, uh, when you look at me right now. I am a natural man. You see me in my personhood. That's the natural man, the physical man. And it says to us that the physical man has not received him. Then, secondly, <coughs> there is the carnal man. One who has received Christ, but one who lives in defeat because he is trying to live the Christian life in his own strength. That is where we fail, when we try to live this life in our own strength. The carnal man is either uninformed about or has forgotten God's love, forgotten the forgiveness and the power that comes to us. This you will find in Romans 5, 8 to 10, Hebrews 10, 1 to 25, 1 John verse 1, 
1 John chapter 2 to 1 to 3. And we recognize that we have maybe forgotten what God has done for us. We've forgotten this power that is made available to us. The carnal man is up and is down in his spiritual experience. He cannot understand for himself. And let me say the carnal man is inclusive of women as well. So we cannot understand for ourselves what is right and what we are supposed to do. The carnal man fails to draw upon the power of the Holy Spirit in order to live the Christian life. May we not be like the carnal man. The carnal man is ignorant of his spiritual heritage, his spiritual identity. The carnal man is disobedient. He is devoid of his love for God and also for others. The carnal man lacks the desire for prayer and for studying the word of the God of God. The carnal man is legalistic and he exhibits the works of the flesh as we have just read according to Galatians chapter 5, 16 to 18. So the carnal man showcases the works of the flesh. The carnal man does not live his life in the Holy Spirit, but in the flesh. May we at Siloam not be carnal. May we at Siloam not live in the works and the doctrine of the flesh, but may we live in the power and in the presence and the provision of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Then thirdly, we have the spirit man. Now who is the spirit man? One who is directed and empowered by the Holy Spirit. One, the person who is Christ-centered, in constant communion with God, empowered by the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, and marked by godliness and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We've read that right now in Galatians chapter 5 from verse 20 to verse 22. Uh, Paul writes to the church and he says, Against the fruit and the doctrine and the working of the Holy Spirit, there is no law. So the spirit man, you and I, we are marked by godliness, marked by righteousness in a world that is ungodly. You and I must arise in the power of the Spirit to be godly. We must show the world what it means to live godly, what it means to live in the power of righteousness, what it means to live in the fullness of who God is. The Spirit man delights himself in the Word of God, delights himself in the law of God. The Spirit man trusts in God. The Spirit man obeys God. God. It is the prophet Samuel that says to King Saul, it is better for you and I to be obedient than to bring different sacrifices to the Lord. You will find that in 1 Kings chapter 14. He says obedience is better than sacrifice. The spirit man knows what it means to obey God. The spiritual man is differentiated from the carnal man by the placing the Holy Spirit, or by the place the Holy Spirit occupies in his life. You and I must honor the place of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We must honor the preeminence of the Holy Spirit. We said it last week in the second service. It is the great Italian evangelist and the great prophet Benny Hinn that wrote the book, uh, Good Morning, Holy Spirit. When we awake in the morning, we must say thank you, Holy Spirit. When we go throughout our day, the leading of the Holy Spirit must be with us. So the Holy Spirit occupies a place of preeminence. It is foremost in our thinking, foremost in our speech, foremost. He is foremost in our dealings and our actions from day to day. To be a spiritual Christian is to live the life of holiness in the Holy Spirit. It entails being filled with the Holy Spirit, according to Ephesians 5 and verse 18. Living by the Spirit and not gratifying the desires of the sinful nature, as we've read in Galatians 5 
and 16. Because as we've read out of Galatians chapter 5, we hear Paul writes and tells us that the spirit man is always in a battle with the carnal man. And the carnal man cannot overpower the spirit man. How do we know this? Because we recognize that the spirit of the Lord is in us. And if the spirit of the Lord is in us and we honor the place of the spirit of the Lord in our lives, then the carnal man cannot defeat us. Then my brother, Brothers and my sisters, I must say this to you. Then despondency, discouragement, despair, distress, whatever you want to place, depression in there, it cannot overpower us because the spirit man is alive to the spirit of God. The spirit man keeps in step with the spirit, is controlled by the Holy Spirit. And the spiritual man is the Christian who lives his life Perfectly in the will of God, following the power of the Holy Spirit. So again, to just differentiate, we go back. You have the natural man. You have the carnal man. You have the spirit man. So unto us is given the understanding and the revelation this morning. That when we practice the spiritual disciplines... When we practice the things and the holiness of God and we are accountable and responsible in our walk with God, then the spirit man will overtake the power of the carnal man, will overtake the power of the natural man. I decree and declare over Siloam and those friends and family of ours that are watching us from everywhere and anywhere that the power of the spirit man is given to you that you will walk in the fullness of that power and that presence of the Holy Spirit in you and you will overcome the flesh you will overcome the desires of the carnal man you will overcome the desires of the natural man I decree and declare over you right now that the, the spirit man is alive and well and strengthened on the inside of you and you overcome the forces of evil and darkness and you can battle it out today and know that victory is given to you because of the power of the spirit man on the inside of you don't let the enemy lie to you don't let circumstances and the conditions of life lie to you you are powerful you have the might of the spirit on the inside of you you are called a victor you are called a conqueror. You are called a winner because of who is alive on the inside of you. The question we may ask is, what is the spirit-filled life? We defined it. We looked at the biblical understanding of the difference uh, in terms of the, the different man that we have in the inside of us and who we are. Now, what is the spirit-filled life? Number one. We touched on this last week, but I want to flesh it out a little bit better today. To be filled with the Spirit is to live with every conscious area of our lives, yielded to the Spirit's control. To be filled with the Spirit is to live with every conscious area of our lives, yielded to the Spirit's control. We are called to live conscious lives. Now, what does it mean to be conscious? All it means is to be switched on. All it means is to be awake. All it means is to be sober in our understanding. All it means is for us to be aware of what happens around, around us. And the spirit man, the spirit filled life is this life where we are alert, we are awake, we are sober, we are switched on to what the spirit commands and demands from us. Luke 4 and verse 1 describes Jesus as full of the Holy Spirit. But you would say, but pastor, is it not that only the, at the baptism of Pentecost the Spirit came? Yes, in our biblical understanding that's true. 
But if you read the Old Testament, if you read uh, from the beginning of Genesis right through to the Old Testament, there are various periods within the, the Old Testament and even the first few parts of the New Testament with Jesus and John the Baptist, where the Holy Spirit came upon them and they were given tasks to fulfill. If you read even in, in, in the Old Testament, people like King David, you read about King Saul, when Saul sees the school of prophets, he goes and joins them and Saul suddenly prophesies. So there are moments where the Spirit's uh, uh, baptism comes upon us and we are given a, a task to do. We are given a specific moment in life to fulfill the purpose and the plan of God in that season, in that moment, and we can do it. Now, as a New Testament understanding and church, we are now filled with the Spirit. We are now given an overwhelming presence of God, directing every part of our lives. That is why we're saying we have to yield to the Spirit's control. So Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus being filled with the baptism of water firstly, and then being full of the Holy Spirit, went about doing the work of the Master. In Acts 6 and verse 3, the apostle directs the early church to select seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom. Allow me to put a pin in it right there and just say, when you are full of the Holy Spirit, you will have a good reputation. When you are full of the Holy Spirit, you will be marked by wisdom, by knowledge, by understanding. You will have the discernment of the seasons and the times because you are full of the Holy Spirit. So when these men were giving themselves to the control and the fullness of the Holy Spirit in them, they were chosen to do specific tasks for the church and for God. May the Spirit's control of your life elevate you to be so full of the power of God that you will have a reputation that precedes you. That you will have a reputation of wisdom. That you will be able to serve your generation. You'll be able to serve the purposes of God. One of them by the name of Stephen, as described in Acts 6 and 5, he said he was full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. Later on, Acts 11.24 describes Barnabas as a man, as a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and full of faith. When you are filled and living in the Spirit-filled life, faith is not a problem for you. You believe without seeing. You believe beyond what is happening before you. You believe then when you walk into a room and there is death and destruction all around you, you know where your help comes from. You know what you are there to do. You know that by the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through you, faith is at a level not experienced in that room and your faith becomes contagious. May you have contagious faith, Siloam, that when you walk into any and every situation Situation of life through the leading of the Holy Spirit because you've given the Holy Spirit full control over you and in you you would know and people would know that this is a man and a woman of faith so the phrase full of the Holy Spirit describes a person who habitually lives with every area of his life under the control of the Holy Spirit I said to you last week we don't compartmentalize our lives before God. We don't say to the Lord, I have a 10 room house. I'll give you nine rooms and I'll keep one room. That's not how it works. We give everything to God. So we recognize that a spirit filled man and woman of God is not a self willed man or woman, but a spirit controlled man and woman of God. The fullness of the Spirit does not mean that we would once had a dramatic experience and then we left it at the altar, but we are consistently walking with our lives given to God. Every arena, every sphere of life, Paul gives us three spheres of life. He gives us our home, which is the oikos. He gives us our home in our home life. 
We are filled with the Spirit. Our families, our children, our spouses, our uh, uh, family beyond the four walls of our home, they experience us as controlled by the Spirit. Then He gives us the temple. He gives us the, the synagogue. He gives us the house of God, the place where we go together to go and worship and fellowship. So when I walk into the beloved and I walk into the place where the children of God meet, they experience the spirit of the Lord with me. Then he gives us the third place, the Agora, which is the place of the market. In the marketplace, in that arena of your life, people must know you are spiritful. People must experience the spirit of God. How will they experience if you've given your life to God? They will experience it as we've read out of Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. They will experience the fruit of the spirit. They will experience God's fruit working in and through your life. So the second part of what is the spiritful life says to us. To be filled with the spirit is to live with the word of God permeating every area of our lives. Every area of our lives showcases that the word of God is alive in us. Every area of our lives is sustained by the word of God. We are upheld by the word of God. We live in the power of the word of God. So we recognize that if it is written, we live it. If it is written, we speak it. If it is written, we translate it into every area, and every part that our lives touches. If we read Ephesians 5 and 18, and if we cross-reference that with uh, Colossians 3 and verse 16, it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, richly. There's so much riches in the power of the word. There's so much riches in God's word that speaks to us. That if we live by his word, we can shift the situations around us. He says, in all wisdom, teaching, important, we have to teach the word. Admonishing, meaning building one another. In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. That's Colossians 3 and 16. If we read Ephesians 5 and 18, it speaks about if we are filled with the spirit then we will be rich in wisdom, teaching, admonishing, another in psalms and songs. So the spirit-filled life is, my brothers and my sisters, supported by your word life. It finds great expression when the word of God is supporting the spirit life inside of you. There is an old rule in mathematics. Now, I'm not a mathematician, <laughs> but there's an old rule in mathematics that says, Things equal to the same thing are equal to one another. If to be filled with the word is equal in result to being filled with the spirit, then it should be clear that the word filled Christian is the spirit filled Christian. How amazing is that not? The word filled child of God is the spirit filled child of God. It works hand in hand. It is equal. It is part of of what God is calling us to walk out and to live out. As the word of Christ dwells in us richly, controls all of our ways, as we walk in obedience to the word of God, the spirit of God fills us. The spirit of God uh, uh, dominates us, controls us. The spirit of God in us is growing to the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So to be the spirit-filled child of God, you must grow in your understanding and your appreciation of the word of God. To be filled with the spirit involves an ever deepening relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. I said it to you already at the beginning. The Holy Spirit is not a force. He is a person. To be filled with the spirit is not a mechanical formula that you and I must go through where you pull the Holy Spirit lever, <laughs> where you press that button and now the Holy Spirit will come. No, it's a relationship that we have beyond just the person of the Holy Spirit. It's a relationship we have with God the Father and God the Son. Because we recognize that Jesus again teaches us 
According to John 4, he teaches us that, the, that we can not John, yes, John 4 and verse 6, he teaches us that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come through the Father except by him. We are made alive in this relationship with Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is an ever deepening relationship, which means there's a difference between those that are new in the Spirit and those that are mature in the Spirit. Both are filled, but the mature child of God is growing stronger and must help the younger child of God to grow in the power and the presence of the Spirit. There are degrees of filling that correspond with our degrees of spiritual understanding and how we surrender. So your capacity is being filled with the Spirit as you grow in the Spirit. So there's a deepening relationship with God through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And as we said, number four, to be filled with the Spirit includes special times of God granting us extraordinary power for service. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, we read that all that were gathered in the upper room on the day of Pentecost were filled with the power and the presence of the Spirit. Peter went out in the power of the Spirit to preach to a crowd that he has never done before, resulting in over 3,000 conversions. The next day, 5,000 were converted. We need the steady flow of God's power for our daily needs to overcome sin and to live in a godly manner. But there are special occasions where the spirit of the Lord will come upon us. Special occasions where there is a downpour of the spirit of the Lord upon us to enable us to preach, to teach, to witness to counsel those, to help those in need. The special filling of the Holy Spirit only supplements the normal habitual filling and living of the Holy Spirit. It would be rare for a person who is not walking daily in the fullness of the Spirit to receive a special filling for a sudden need and a sudden responsibility. Wherever you find yourself, Wherever and whomever you interact with, there will come a moment where God needs you to arise in power. Where God needs you to not look at who you are. If you are able to do it, if you're not able to do it. There will come a moment when even if you say like Moses to God, you say to him, but I can't speak. God will say, but I will use another mouthpiece. I just need you to lead. There'll come a moment like when you are like Gideon hiding in the wine press and, and afraid of the enemies that are coming to be destructive in your life. And the spirit of the Lord will say to you, but you are a mighty man and a mighty woman of valor because God needs your testimony. God needs your life to make a difference in the life of others. And it comes when you live by the spirit. It comes when you recognize that God needs me in this moment to be a mouthpiece for him, to bring calm, to bring peace, to bring joy in situations where there is no joy, to be a comfort to those that need comfort and to be a strength to those that are unable to see their way out of difficulty. God will give you his power and you speak according to his power. The question we may ask today is, Pastor, how can I be assured that I am filled with the Holy Spirit? Two things I'm going to hold before you. The Spirit-filled life produces ever-deepening Christ-likeness. Because in John, Jesus teaches the disciples and he teaches us that the Spirit will testify, will be a witness to who he is. You and I will see growth. You and I will see maturity when the spirit-filled life produces us and helps us to be more Christ-like. Like a child growing day by day, it's always discernible. When you look back of where you started and where you are now, 
that you are becoming more like Jesus. The fruit of the Spirit, we've mentioned it. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control will grow in your life. You will also be growing in the conduct of Christ. You will experience consistent victories over the deeds and the actions and the desires of the flesh. We've read it out of Galatians 5. If the Spirit grows in us, if the Spirit-filled life finds expression through us, then we are victorious over our carnality and our flesh. We will become more like Christ. The Spirit-filled life results in heartfelt worship and thankfulness to God, along with godly relationships. Think about this. If you grow in the Spirit-filled life, my brother and my sister, your life is marked by worship. Your life is marked by thankfulness unto God. Your life is marked with relationships. God places people in your life that is there to build you. God's placing people in your life that is there to help you mature and to grow in the things of God, in the beauty of holiness, in righteousness. You have people being given to you that will allow you to walk in your God-given a destiny. I come to a close of the sermon this morning and I highlight four things very quickly. Benefits of living in the spirit-filled life. Yes, there are always benefits. There are always a reward. I have a practical, everyday leading from God himself. The spirit of God is a gift unto us. It's not a dictator. While the Lord is faithful to lead us, we can become easily distracted. We become stubborn sometimes. But if we truly allow the benefits of the spirit-filled life to take full fruition in us, we will be led by the Lord daily. You walk into any room, you say, Holy Spirit, lead me. You go and write a test, Holy Spirit, lead me. You go into a meeting, Holy Spirit, lead me. Those who are actively following the Spirit will bear unmistakable witness and evidence that it's the Spirit that leads them. People will know there's something different about you. People will seek the difference in your life when you are led by the Lord himself. Number two, as we've said it already, I have fearless I have intimacy with Christ, fearless intimacy with Christ. I am unafraid of what this world brings. I'm unafraid of the task and the assignments placed upon my life because through the power of the Spirit, I have this intimate walk with God. We have been freed and we are set free. He has purchased us. The payment of the death of Christ on the cross is our greatest salvation. He is not just a kind master to us, but he is our Abba. He's our father. It's an Arabic term that's an endearment from children to their father. He's Abba to us. We have intimacy with the almighty creator of the heavens and the earth. We have an obligation as his sons and daughters as his sons and daughters to have a genuine inheritance and to be part of what our Abba has for us. Number three, we have the assurance of belonging to Jesus. We have the assurance of belonging to him. If the Holy Spirit speaks into the souls and into the spirit of his beloved sons and daughters, it's only to say this to you this morning, you are my precious child. This is the only place in the New Testament in which we are told that the Holy Spirit speaks in a prophetic way as a general practice unto us. When Jesus opens the new covenant through the giving of his life to us, the Lord spoke to the apostles. The Lord spoke to his disciples. He speaks to us even now and he says that you are mine and I am yours. And then number four, I have a continual reminder of my value before my great creator. Through the adoption of the Holy Spirit and bringing us into this walk with Christ. Through the adoption of Christ making us his own. 
we are made co-heirs with Christ Jesus. Through our identification with him, we stand to inherit everything that God has for us because of the work of the Spirit in our lives. Existing in the Spirit is not about what we can do for Christ. And for our God. The spiritful life is about what he will do on our behalf. Because he has given us this free gift. So what are we to do? Nothing. We don't have to work for it. We don't have to jump through hoops for it. We and you and I, all we need to do is accept it. And to live in it. This is the power of the spiritful life. And as you are blessed by this word this morning, make it a reality to live in the power of the spirit filled life. Make it a reality to live in this power, to make it part of who God is calling you to be, to make it a reality of your walk with God from day to day that this is who I am. I'm a child of God. He calls me his own. He reminds me of my value. I have more than what the world can offer me because he who is in me is greater than the world that is outside of me. Christ gives us this power. Christ gives us this identity by living in the spirit. Let us pray this morning. Stretch out your hands before the Lord and let us pray. Father, I thank you that as I raise my hands to my brothers and my sisters, In the spirit they live, they move and have their being. In the spirit they will grow. Through the power of the spirit, they will find life. Through the power of the spirit, they will know who you are. Through the power of the spirit, they will grow in Christ likeness. Through the power of the spirit, they will inherit everything that you are and everything that you have purpose for them. May they grow in the spirit of the Lord. May they grow in the identity of who they are. And may the Spirit bring life to them. This morning, if you don't know who Jesus is. This morning, if you don't know the beauty of living the Spirit-filled life. I want you to say to the Lord, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. I accept you as Lord and Savior. I pray that the Spirit of the Lord will come in me. And make known to me who you are. Who the Father is. Make known to me who I am before you. I accept the work of the Spirit. I accept the leading of the Holy Spirit. Make me your own. And if you want to rededicate your life to the Lord, just say, Lord Jesus, I come in the forgiveness yet again of the cross and through the power of the Spirit, I am made alive in you. I am made alive to live out the purpose and the promise that you have for me. Amen and amen. Thank you, family, for watching. Thank you for tuning in. You've seen the announcements. You've seen the happenings here at church. We are thankful that you are part of what Siloam does. And we ask of you to like, to share, to follow, to subscribe, to be a part of this great ministry as we come to lead you by the power of the Spirit to where God is calling you to be. Be blessed and thank you for tuning in today. Amen.